in case y'all are wondering, it takes like the camera like five or seven seconds to start up and cache all the data. So I have to watch the lights to see when they're when it starts up. So that's what I'm looking for every time. Uh, the last word that we kind of need to know in the history of the processes that I just went through is stiction. Stiction is a made up word that uh, began in the 80s um, when we had uh, old hard drives. They're, the hard drives are lubricated. I'm on page, page my own? 47. So hard drives are lubricated and so they actually have a lubricant on the platters. And the heads will stick to, if they land anywhere on the platter, they will stick to that material. <clears throat> Sometimes it's actually digging into the material, but most of the time it's just stuck on the platter because the head did not fully return to its park position or something else happened. And so the lubricant dries and then it takes more force to break the head free than the drives platters can produce. So it's called stiction. Still happens to this day. We'll go through processes sometimes where a head is just stuck to the platter and if you spin it appropriately, you do it just right, a good percentage of the time it never rips the head off, doesn't do any damage or anything. Maybe you get a spot where it hit the platter that you can't read again or whatever, but generally speaking, correctly handled, most of the time you can get around the problem and break it free. And so the reason I'm bringing this one up is that there are occasions that we will run into an environmental situation where maybe it will help to do, this is just a list of all the stuff we talked about, it will help to do this. Um, I'm going into the mists and going to talk about mists for a second, but this is tied to this one. Freezing the drive can help you recover the data. So here's the thing that people talk about all the time, and there's like all these tech tips and all this other stuff. I'm just going to tell you, 99% of the time, freezing the drive is a really, really bad thing to do. Putting the drive in the freezer does some other things to the drive, such as depending upon whether or not you have um, a motor or fluid dynamic bearings, which we will talk about motors. Some have ball bearings, and some are called fluid dynamic bearings. And the fluid dynamic bearings has ester oil in it. And ester oil, if you freeze it, will seize the drive. The motor can seize coming out of a freezer because the ester oil on a fluid dynamic bearing sits at the bottom, which means it's not lubricating the entire shaft for the motor to spin. And if it freezes, that's a real big problem. That's why sometimes bringing a hard drive or a laptop in from outside when it's been freezing cold outside and you start it up, rather than waiting for it to re resume at room temperature, then it will lock up or you lose your drive or something bad happens. Metal contracts when it's cold. And if your head's already flying close to the platter and it contracts, now you can scratch a platter and you can do more damage. So these are things that are pretty bad as a whole. However, if your head is stuck to a platter and stiction is a problem and you knew it was a problem and you had a pretty good idea that that's what it was, before you open the drive or before you have to deal with the drive, it is completely possible that at least cooling it off or freezing it enough that it will cause the contraction problem might break the head free. And so there are some times that stiction can be done by this method of refrigerating it. Now, stiction, when the head is stuck to the platter, there are a couple of sounds that the drive will make that are specific sounds and I can tell what they are. Now, you don't have to trust my sounds. I've labeled all the sounds and I've put them on this memory stick. So I have recorded as much as I can and I've, uh, and I've tried to do either some videos or some just MP3s and stuff, but I've got a directory on here and it's called hard drive sounds or whatever and I've labeled them head stuck with stiction or something like that. But I'm gonna tell you what it sounds like from my perspective. So the first one is, so, there's a couple of different sounds as you're going through the whole thing. Like for instance, when a hard drive first spins up, um, when it hasn't reached the speed that the platter should be turning at, then it doesn't move a piece of plastic. There is a, when it spins up, it creates the air bearing surface, and there is a piece of plastic 
that locks and unlocks the heads. It is that simple. It is literally a piece of plastic that sits on a pin. When the motor spins up, it creates an air bearing surface and the platter, this piece of plastic moves. And when the piece of plastic moves, what's happening is there's a piece of plastic down at the tail and the actuator arm is sitting like this. So the actuator arm's got a pin sitting in the way so that it can't move because this piece of plastic, which needs the air bearing surface on the drive to turn, will sit there and it'll, it, it clicks. You'll see, you'll hear a tiny clicking noise. That's what it'll sound like in the process. So when it's starting up, sometimes you'll hear it do tick, 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 and then it unmounts, and then it looks correct and everything sounds fine because that's still trying to release the heads and move them out onto the platter. But that piece of plastic's in the way. And then eventually it spins up correctly. When it's finished spinning up, then the plastic teeters out of the way and the back of the arm unlocks and it can go out. Does that make sense to everybody? When the head is stuck on the platter because maybe uh, some power outage caused it to do this. Power outages shouldn't cause that to happen because the idea is there's enough power generated by the motor while it's powered off to send the power back towards the actuator arm and use that to move the actuator arm back to park position. But if your power goes out in a brownout and then comes back on, then it causes the head to go, oh, okay, I'm fine now, and then try to recover from it. Then the power goes out again. Now there's not enough power to get it back to its park position. It stops and it sticks right in the middle of the platter. Things like that happen all the time Servers, different equipment, I've seen it on a whole bunch of things. I've seen sometimes I've pulled out a raid array where all of the heads on all the drives are all stuck to the platter. That It's rare, but it has happened. So whatever happened caused a power interruption that affected everything. So when the head is stuck to the platter, you'll hear kind of what would sound like the platter starting to spin up, but it's a motor and it's trying to jerk the head and it goes eek, 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 eek. If you hear that sound, the head or the platter or something isn't moving, it is probably the head stuck to the platter. There's a chance that there's something more significant than that, like for instance, somebody dropped the drive and all the heads are now crushed onto the platter. And so that can happen and same, same thing, basically all your heads are stuck to the platter and you can't do anything about it, but, um, but you'll have to do a rebuild in that process. But a lot of times, if the head is stuck to the platter, you're going to just get this one sound. It goes, sounds like the motor trying to spin up. It never spins up, and it just goes, ee, 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 like that, all the time. There's two other sounds, depending on the brand of drive, and one of them sounds like Star Trek. I swear it sounds exactly like phasers. It goes, pew, 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 pew. And it sounds like somebody shooting a Star Trek laser beam phaser gun or something. So... Uh, so if you hear that sound, head stuck to platter. And then the last one sounds like your hard drive is trying to play music from itself. So it'll sound like a MIDI tone, like the old MIDI recordings, and you go, that is another sign that your head is stuck to the platter. So when you hear any of those three sounds, and you'll get used to eventually when you hear enough drives or you listen to it, you'll be like, oh, that sounds exactly like, what does that mean? Well, those are, those are the things that you're looking for. And most of the time, you can take the top of a hard drive off if you're in a pretty clean area. Now, there'll be a lot of arguments about clean areas. We'll talk about that later. But technically, there was a lot of data recovery companies that ran out of garages who did not have anything for years. And now they're singing a tune like, it, like every drive will never work again if you ever open it. And it's a lie. Uh, the majority of drives will be fine in a pretty good clean area because the air bearing surface also is going to keep anything from sitting on top of the platters as long as it's not stuck to the platter. So uh, usually the things that stick to a platter are you, your skin, your eyelashes, oil, hair, fingerprints, things like that that don't fling off. If it's, uh, unfortunately dust is mostly made from human, but if, it, if a piece of dust actually landed on a platter and you spun it up, it will fling it off before the head moves over to the top of the platter. So, uh, but again, you should be in a more clean environment most of the time than to be looking around and seeing dust flying around in your room, uh, even though there probably always is. So, those are the main things that you want to listen for when you're talking about a head stuck to the platter. So, freezing a drive 
It can work sometimes, but it's got to be an environmental problem. There's another problem. Let me see if I have internet access and I'll show you the other issue that happens. Anybody heard of 10 whiskers? Do you know what 10 whiskers are? No? Yes? Right, exactly. Uh, so what happens is, over the years, they have decided that lead eventually, because we trash all of our stuff, it makes its way to a landfill, then the lead rots out of all of our computer equipment at some point in time and goes into our water supply and kills us. And so they have been gradually removing lead from solder for years. And that's why they say like this Mac is green and it's not going to contaminate us and it's not made with any products that will contaminate us. But there's a very huge side effect of making uh, any kind of solder without lead in it. Lead keeps down tens resistance to growing as a crystal. So, this is called tin whiskers. I'll show you some pictures. And so this is a pretty serious thing. Uh, so solder without lead will grow and grow faster. And it'll grow like a crystal grows. So it grows like hair. And on electrical components, it doesn't matter how thick or thin that wire is. Pretty much anything that can contaminate or touch anything at this point in time. I mean, look how small and thin that that is. And then when you get something that's corroding it and it touches anything else, then that becomes a huge problem. And it shorts all your equipment. So, for instance, the space shuttle and all equipment that goes into space has to be made with a large quantity of lead. They will not allow them to be built with anything else. They'll, they'll have a requirement for the quantity of lead that has to be in them because it's even worse once you get out of our normal environment. So there'll be a lot of things that deteriorate over time and you'll end up in a situation like this where some small component will con contact or touch another component. So if you have an old hard drive and it's not working correctly, there is a chance that these whiskers have grown and touched. And surprisingly, another thing that happens now, most of the time it's easier if you take a cleaning solution, uh, everything from scrubbing bubbles to something else, and then use a brush, and you just brush over the board and clean the board. Uh, there's also oxidizing and deoxidizing agents and things that you can buy to clean the boards and the drives. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good, I mean, this one actually looks exactly what we have on hard drives. Like that's actually what we would see on the legs of the ROM chips and stuff that way we would actually have. And if they short at all, it's, it's an over. So, but you can see these, these are all surface mount. You can use a brush and you can clean them and scrub in between all the pieces and possibly get it to work. Now, that's one of the first processes we do in a lot of drives if they're not working when they come in, is we just go ahead and start cleaning them. We have, um, we have uh, transceivers and stuff like that. You can put them in a bath and you can wash them. You can put them in uh, scrubbing bubbles, which is common for phones. People do it for phones all the time. You scrubbing bubbles at all, you guys? No? Uh, when you got to clean a phone that's been dropped in the water. So those are the kind of things that you want to do. Um, now, as far as this, surprisingly, sometimes freezing it breaks that whisker free because now you've got contract then it starts to get warm and it expands and now it breaks the whisker and it'll actually work. So, but most of the time your drive will not work after 10 minutes if it did work. So it'll heat up and then it'll be right back in the same position it is. Maybe a leg popped off and it, when it froze it sat back down and touched made contact. So there'll be a lot of things like that. It does create another problem which is condensation. No matter how much rice you put in a bag and put the drive in the bag, when you have a temperature change, it's still going to create condensation. And that is worse for your drive than probably any of the other options that you have. So just keep that in mind, I would say, is not the best option at all. Now, temperature does matter to the drives when they're running. Heads can overheat. So I've seen situations where if we take something, um, we can even put a ribbon 
into the refrigerator with the drive in it running while the system is outside and we're recovering the data, keeping the drive cooler in a wine cooler or something like that. I've seen guys take, um, you know, those popsicles where you freeze the popsicle and, you know, you, it slides down in, you know, a little tube or whatever. Take a whole string of those and wrap them around drives while they're running. Like, they're creating moisture in the process, but they're getting their data off, and if they do it quick enough, they're done. So temperature does make a difference sometimes in keeping the drive running. Uh, and we'll get back into those things and what you can do to cool drives while they're running. I typically use aluminum and fans and things like that where I can offset the heat. And you can also use what's called a Peltier cooler, which is a ceramic piece which is powered with low voltage, which will transfer heat from one side to the other side. And so it's cold on one side and hot on the other side which is those little tiny refrigerators that you buy that are USB refrigerators that you put on your desk and you plug it into USB, that's what's in it. It's called a Pelt Air Cooler. And surprisingly, the component in it is more expensive than buying the little refrigerator. So, because you can, you buy that one piece, it'll be 50 bucks, but you buy the little refrigerator, it's $20. So there's important pieces in it that you can buy those things and take them apart. Anyway, so frozen is not your best chance. Now, this is one thing in my rewrite that I'm changing until a few years ago, there was no such thing as a hermetically sealed drive unless you were, um, military had some under certain conditions. Other than that, it wasn't commercially available. But now we have hermetically sealed drives, helium drives are hermetically sealed. The whole point of hermetically sealed means I have no exchange with the outside air. And so if that were true, water would not be a problem. Because if a drive was submerged in water, the only thing that would be contaminated is the board and the drive and the contents inside would still be fine. The head would still be fine, but that's not true. If you have a drive that goes into a lake or goes into, uh, you know, you have a rain storm like Katrina or somebody like that, then in that particular instance, your content is submerged in water. There is water inside. Now you've got a cleaning problem that's much more severe than that. And most hard drives actually have a hole on them somewhere that say, I got a breather hole, I got, I'm exchanging air. Some have a filter on the top so you'll actually see the hole and a filter inside and they're exchanging air with the outside world and water will get into that. And water does do damage internally. You do not want to turn a drive on that has been wet like that. It will do more damage. You can reassemble the drive. There is a possibility of saving those that are coming out of a lake, a freezer, fridge, whatever it is, anything that's, that's been submerged in water. You can actually get that content back but you have to do a cleaning process and a rebuild process. It is not cheap, it is very expensive. I'll show you the material and the basics of how to do it, but what we're gonna do all week long applies to that exactly the same way with the exception that you've gotta sit there with a bath cleaning the, the drive until you get all of the sediment out of the drive and off of the drive before you do your rebuild. But everything else is exactly the same. But the material is expensive to clean the drives. Uh, you cannot just use alcohol and get by. That does not work. So that can do as much damage as it helps. So, okay. Um, so one of the next things that everybody tells me in data recovery at least uh, is they think the manufacturer will help me in some way. So if I have a problem with a client, I'm saying, listen, it's really hard to find this drive. It's rare. I have to have this exact version of the ROM. They'll sometimes think, well, why don't you just call the manufacturer and ask them for this ROM? Like, no, they're not going to help me. They're not going to help. As a matter of fact, they don't even want me to do this job because they don't want anybody to know how bad the Western Digital Drive is or how bad the Seagate Drive is. They get really upset when we start combining data and telling people, like Backblaze is, theirs is obvious because theirs is just running in the server and how many drives died and they just count them and they pull them out. But if we actually got together as data recovery people and said, what are the problems that we're seeing? When we get a line that shows like 97% of all drives have the same failure, then it's a real problem. Like for instance, the firmware bug, in 2008 there was a set of drives released by Seagate that had a firmware bug in it. And it was horrible. It's, the, it's one of the worst ones that has ever been and it affects a whole chain of drives. They all seem to work fine for a while and then all of a sudden one of the log files inside the drive gets corrupt and the uh, smart table gets corrupt, then the drive will no longer boot anymore. And so it won't run. It'll, it gives you two symptoms and it locks up. And so there are some things that will happen and we'll discuss those as well, but that's a firmware patch. In order to get the drive running again, there's no other way around it. And so they're called the F3 series of drives. So you can decide what F3 means, but uh, 
but everybody who had them does get all three Fs. So, um, but they do, you can fix them, you can get around the problem, but I'm just saying those are the kind of things that happen. The manufacturer doesn't want us to be involved or tell you everything that we know. Um, the drive also has some intelligence in it that it can tell when something's wrong and stop operating. The problem is they don't have a lot of ways to tell you I stopped operating for these problems so that you can fix me. But in our world, in data recovery, we do have modes where it will tell us, uh, like the PC3000 is one of the tools that if you hook it up and it is in safe mode, it will tell you that. And it'll say that the drive has fallen into safe mode because there is something corrupt maybe in the ROM or in a table, and it doesn't know how to deal with it, so it just stops loading it. And so that is called safe mode. And the best way for me to describe it, as far as what you would normally hear on a day-to-day -day being if you were doing this drive, is that it would do the clicking, the three clicks, and then go to sleep, and then wake up, and then do the three clicking again. It will never ever, once it gets into that mode, never ever return from that. There's no chance that it, next time it turns on that it's gonna do this. So it'll go click, 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 stop, power off, turn back on, click, 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 power, like, and it'll go through the cycle. Uh, it doesn't always power off. Uh, three and a half inch drives will try over and over and over again. Two and a half inch drives will give up. They'll eventually go click, 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 and then park, and then turn off, and then they won't come back on. So they'll go into safe mode when they know they can't read part of the ROM and they can't function or run. Um, so now the next part of this is uh, your hard drive. Now remember we talked about the P list and the G list this morning. The P list is the primary or the permanent list that's bad, and then there's a G list. The G list is your grown list of sectors that have gone bad after you've tried to use them. And you may have been using them for a while, and then eventually they no longer are good. They're magnetic, so eventually you're going to wear them out, and then they no longer work again. So here's the problem. Um, what is in, let's say in sector three, it goes bad and gets added to the G list. And now every time the hard drive reads data, it no longer reads it from the original sector. It goes to the system area and reads the new data. And so it'll go along that path all the time and read that new data. What is in the old sector three? What data is there? Well, what do you think would be there? Yeah, similar to Slack space. It's going to be extra junk that was written back then, and now it points to a new location, so new data is being refreshed over here. But you don't know what random data is in that old sector that was left behind. It didn't erase it. It's still there. So the data exists, but you no longer have access to it. Does that make sense? And you won't unless you have a PC3000. You won't have access to that data. So unless you're some special dude who knows I gotta go out and buy a PC3000 to get to that sector, you won't ever know that, right? So you, let's say you, uh, you work at the DOD and you have a bunch of hard drives and you are told to wipe those hard drives and make sure there's no data on them anymore and just coincidentally we're gonna sell them on eBay. It's not gonna happen, but let's say you're gonna do that, right? Get my point, right? Or release them or put them somewhere or surplus them. It doesn't matter what you're going to do with them. They're probably not going to be with you anymore unless you guys decide to crush them. Right? So you're going to get rid of these drives somehow. Your danger is no matter what you do to wipe those drives using normal methods, you cannot get rid of the content in the G list. Whatever those sectors are that have been written to prior are still there and you have a danger that that might be a password file or uh, an IP number or something dangerous that you don't want the rest of the world to know. And I will tell you, 30% of the time, there's enough data in one sector for me usually to be able to tell you uh, who you did business with or what it was about or some file on the system. And I've done these before. I've had... Um, I've worked for Intel a few times. I've worked for other companies that they send you items that come off of a line after they're supposedly wiped and they are trying to do a recertification process to see you know, what in our process fails and see how many drives. And out of 10 drives from most of these vendors, I can recover three of them 
something from them. Something, because I wasn't supposed to get anything. I was supposed to get zero. Somebody certified them as erased. And, uh, saying that's uh, that's the direction that some of that went anyway so those are I'm only temporarily turning off my mic so people don't hear all my secrets uh, that uh, might get me in a lot of trouble if they got published um, so not that I like that from that standpoint. like I'll testify if I have to but uh, you know when a company hires you to do it and then prove it that's a little different scenario than I'm proving it and then going against the company so because I've got enough other stories and I've got documented proof on some of the others that I've used in court so I can show you those and we'll talk about those later so that we can't draw a line between the two and the one I just said um, so anyway so the point is this uh, again the G list you cannot get rid of easily at all so Gordon Hughes the guy who wrote the other book called hard drive that I talked about earlier he uh, back in 2004 2003 and 2004 he went to the ATA Command Committee, it's called the T13 Committee, uh, which still today, if that's what you want to look up the specs for hard drives and how they have to work, there's a committee that's involved in the communication process for how hard drives have to work for certain commands. Now, they can make their own commands internally, but you have to have a certain set of them to communicate natively across all motherboards, operating systems, file systems, everything else. So, uh, so they go to the committee, they ask for a command to erase track by track the data in the tracks. So in other words, I don't need to know what the drive knows about the G list. I just erase the whole track. So it goes all the way across the track erasing all of the G list content that would be there without touching the G list table because every manufacturer might modify them. So they have to write a command or supposed to write a command into the drive that is called the uh, secure erase process. There's also a secure erase enhanced. And just trust me again, you should test all of your findings on these because I've found code to do different stuff. But Secure Erase, the premise is that I, it's not a tool. I know it looks like a tool. All the tool does is pass the command to the ATA controller on the hard drive. So it passes it through and says to the hard drive, go do this thing. And when it does, the drive stops responding to all requests. The drive will go off into Never Never Land, do its own thing, until it's done and it's all local to the drive so it's very fast by comparison so right now if you use a tool like dban is a common erasure tool so it's a linux disk you put it in a machine you push a button and you say erase all my hard drives and it runs across all the hard drives erasing stuff it's pretty simple it's pretty straightforward um Dar darwin's boot and nuke or whatever uh so that tool has to transfer every sector across every drive. So every all the way across the bus. So anytime you're talking to every sector, it has to go, erase me, here's a bunch of zeros. Erase me, here's a bunch of zeros. Erase me, here's a bunch of zeros. So it does that for every single thing that it has to touch. When you send an ATA command that says do secure erase, it says, hey drive, erase yourself. 
and it goes and uses its own internal code and says, okay, sector by sector, bleh, and it just starts going through the process. So it's not transferring over the bus. It's the difference between Microsoft Access and SQL Server. Like it's the same concept there, okay? Everybody good with those things? So uh, he later asked for a more advanced version that did three passes in logging. So this whole point is supposed to be that it's supposed to use the standard for uh, sanitation, the DOD standard 5220, and then it's supposed to erase reallocated blocks. That's what those are called, reallocated blocks, or what you want to get rid of so that you no longer have any data in them. So that's what this is for. So if you ever need to do an erasure process, try secure erase enhanced and then secure erase before you move on to any other process. There are some tools that are made to do all of the processes in order. Um, so there's a, um, Weeby Tech makes a tool that it, start, it has like 35 processes in code and it's called Drive Erasure. And you hook it up and it starts with the highest level all the way down to the lowest level. So it starts until it finds the first one that it can run and then erases all of the positions that it can. Does that make sense? So you should be looking in that direction to erase something, but you can do this on a Linux box or anything else. You have to be careful about Intel motherboards because Intel considers this to be a possible virus situation. And uh, the problem is, is that you could never run it like a virus could run it because you can't be an active hard drive in the system when you start running it. So it can't be like Windows is booted and running uh, it would have to be uh, just a plugged in drive, separate. So, but you can do this with other, other items. Just have a motherboard in the corner somewhere hooked up and you can do it. Um, anyway, so that was kind of the quick story. He has a more advanced process for doing that as well. So if you need a logging process, but just try verification too to make sure. All right, the next thing is I already talked about this, the secret magic tool that can recover everything regardless of what the hard drive is. Uh, basically, um, in, you know, more than 20 years ago, there was the chance or the possibility that you could use a magnetic tool to read the magnetism on the drive and recover that data. Now, it's way more difficult than what it sounds like. You have to have all the platters. You have to have the layout, the encoding. There's only ever been one machine that was made that could read data pretty consistently that wasn't from its original source with its original heads in the original hard drive. It was a tool that was made by a company called ActionFront and they never released the tool. They demoed it someplace. They took uh, Western Digital Drives with a generic type of head and it could only do like 40 gig drives and you could take the platters out of a drive and put them in this machine and in two months it would have some of your data. So like it would take a long time for it to do it and there was some process that they did. Action Front never released it. They only talked about it and had some propaganda stuff and showed it at a conference someplace which is the only reason I'm bringing it up because people talk about stuff all the time that never happens and they never released and you know make imaginary things. But uh, Action Front got bought by Seagate. It is now Seagate's data recovery company. They have their own data recovery, you know, uh, 365 whatever recovery. That's what their their company is, I365. Um, they never they never used this tool. Never made it. Never did anything with it. As, and as far as I know, they don't even have it. They don't even have anything additional that ever ran. But that's the only time it's ever come up. Um, so. Anyway, so this tool uh, and a process you can actually use, you can kind of see where layout of data is, what bits would look like. This is a CD-ROM though, so this doesn't really kind of count in the normal realm of what you'd see on a hard drive because the encoding process is completely different. Uh, but I got somebody to take a picture for me. Uh, I got two pictures. This is a broken one, so that if you had a broken platter, the idea was that you could try to read the data using this without a spinning disk. It's not possible. It's not plausible. There's no reason to even keep talking about it from the standpoint. And once we spit, switch to GMR and perpendicular, the encoding process is so in-depth that it now would be impossible to use a cantilever and any kind of regular magnetic recording material. On top of the fact you need to have the complete layout from whoever the manufacturer is for their encoding process in order to get around this content. Okay? So there is some tests that were done on this. 
this is a paper that was released. Um, I actually know two of the guys in this list, or knew two of the guys, Craig Wright and Dave Kleiman. Um, and I made this slide many years ago. I was really good friends with Dave Kleiman, um, and he is he has now perished. Um, and so he has been he he died in 2011, 2011-ish. Um, and you might recognize Craig Wright and Dave Kleiman as the two that are battling or the battle that's going on right now about Bitcoin. Um, Craig Wright has claimed that he created Bitcoin. He is now living in hiding from Australia in London. He's now moved to London to get away from what they're trying to do to him in Australia. Um, but the claim was that the two of them created Bitcoin and that there's a huge amount of money that um, has been held in a repository somewhere and that Dave Kleiman's family knows somehow uh, about this money and how much he supposedly was given and or in the process of creating these and they're the first one million bitcoins that were mined and so now I knew Dave for many many years and he took this class before actually and uh, he used to carry around this dongle on his neck and it was fully encrypted and not encrypted with like little encrypted like a, a, a 40 character password to get into this dongle and he would lock the dongle up in his safe when he would go to sleep and things like that so uh, I knew he was carrying around something pretty valuable and uh, and he as a forensics guy he was a forensics guy and we talked almost every day. Like we either chatted on email or something else every day. Um, and I miss him a lot. But uh, And I believe that he probably does have or would have had some of these coins. Because I actually believe Craig Wright, even though there's many people who said he did not create Bitcoin. And that there's mathematical computation showing why he didn't. You can follow this whole path right now. It's still going on. There's a legal battle going on right now. And surprisingly, it's coming up like any day. Like maybe, I think it might be today. Um, he uh, supposedly Craig Wright put the encryption key he did the uh, back to the future thing um, he gave it to Western Union he gave the key to Western Union and gave them a scheduled date to deliver it and where to deliver it in the future and he did this like something like 10 years ago so all of the keys that were in the Bitcoin lockers and the wallets were locked up with this encryption key that 10 years ago he gave to Western Union and said, give these to me in January of 2020. So it's coming up, like sometime this year, sometime this week or this month uh, is coming up. So you can go Google it. You'll, you'll find out. It's all true. Anyway, so, um, but I've met Craig Wright many times and he used to work for my partner in Australia. And I will tell you, he's one of the most brilliant computer guys I've ever met in my whole life. And he is, he's a different person. He's not, he's not a normal person that, in the sense of what we call a normal person. Um, but he is a brilliant guy. And so there's a chance that maybe this is true and maybe he'll show up with this. But uh, again, that's kind of the Bitcoin story. Um, another thing that I don't invest in... <laughs> Uh, and he had a particular reason, I'll go into it later, for creating Bitcoin. But uh, there will be a lot of people who would tell me I'm full of crap and that this, it can't be right. And uh, some brilliant people also. But we'll see. All right, anyway. So, again, there's a paper written on that. And the whole point is they tested drives to see if they could recover them. And they don't say in the paper, you can go look at the paper, buy the paper, and see what it says, but ultimately it said that the error bit rate is so high, it's not plausible. So that's ultimately what you get down to. So, and those were all pre-2006 drives, too, that they tested. All right, so now we are on, what page are we on? All right, so, so here's the thing. Your hard drive knows nothing about your files. It knows nothing about the structure. It 
only knows logical blocks. It doesn't have any idea about what you're storing on it. And that's the whole point, is that it's a generic storage medium so that it can be used across multiple operating systems and file systems without regard for what that content is. Except for one major change called trim. So when Microsoft was getting involved pre-Vista, uh, uh, with solid state medium and solid state drives, they went to the T13 command committee, just like Gordon Hughes did, and they said, listen, we need something that tells us that this isn't a spinning disk, that this is solid state media. So we would like to have a command called trim, and you can respond with an answer. Are you solid state or are you a hard drive? And so when they apply the trim command, they will get a response back. And because of that response, several things happen um, inside of the operating system. One of them is the operating system stops caching certain files. So there's a prefetch directory, there's application caching. It stops defragmentation. Fragmented solid state drives aren't really a real thing. That's a, that's a, that's a false concept. Anything that tries to defragment a solid state drive is only doing more damage is not doing anything good at all. So those functions are turned off. But even more important, the trim function does one other thing for solid state drives that nothing else does. It does an immediate delete. So the problem with early solid state hard drives, when we used to test them and go through the process, a drive would start to fill up. And if you deleted something, it didn't delete it right then, it put it in a queue. And it said, oh, later on, we're gonna do some garbage collection and we're going to run this at an idle time. And so now the problem is drives aren't really idle. They're almost never idle. Something's going on all the time. So they don't have an idle time period. And if the drive gets full, even though you're overriding the same content, so you've got 20 gigs and you fill up 20 gigs and you're at 19.6 gigs and you rewrite a file that already exists. The concept that you have is that I'm reading a file that's 20 gigs, that's the same file, I can modify it and then put it back. But that's not how a solid state drive works. It doesn't put it back in the same place. It actually puts it back in a new place and then erases the old one. So when it's full, it cannot do that at all. So here's what happens. Uh, it goes through a process called read, modify, erase, write. So it reads the content from the drive, puts it into memory, modifies it in memory to the new changes that you want, goes back to the drive and says, I need to put you back down here, but I can't, so I need to erase you. It erases that spot, which it can't do by itself. It's not one file. It has to move a bunch of files around. So it has to load those into memory also. And so you've got a limited amount of memory on the device. So now you've got a process that's taking a really long time. It has to swap little pieces of itself all over the place, like a page file does. And then it eventually then will write that content back down when it's finally done. So when you get a full hard drive, it's super, super, a false, full solid state, it's super, super slow. Now we don't have quite the same problem we used to have because now NAND is cheaper. They just add more NAND and then they wear level it into a space that wasn't supposed to exist. So now you've got a whole nother process taking place. But in infinite wisdom that Microsoft had, and I'm not saying it's bad wisdom, it's just infinite wisdom that they have, that they always seem to try to do something into the future to destroy our livelihoods. Um, they decided that when you kick off the trim command, it immediately deleted whatever file. It tells the drive, don't put me in garbage collection and don't wait till later, do it now. So your drive actually pauses for a second and it erases the sectors involved in that transaction now. So what that means to us is in a drive that's trim enabled, when you delete content, it doesn't really exist anymore. Like it depends on your operating system and your file system and cache and all these other things, but effectively if trim is enabled, it erases that content now and it's gone. And there's no recovery from it. You'll search that drive all day long and it won't be there. Works really well on Microsoft systems, still fairly poor on, um, on all the Macs. On Macs, there's still some process that I've been able to rebuild and do some of that, so I'm not sure they've got everything completely enabled, and that might have something to do with the iPhone, like because they're all basically the same thing, that there's some differences that have transactioned there, but uh, APFS is a new file system sitting on top of it, and there may be some other things. APFS is incredibly difficult to recover from anyway. It's already 
again, uh, something that destroys our livelihood. They're trying to destroy everything that we can to recover data from. All right, so the hard drive does not know anything about your files. The only transaction that really happens now is that if it's a solid state drive, then your operating system and the file system, which is unusual, never happened before, are both involved in the transaction. So solid state drives, it can cause your operating system and your file system to become both involved in the transaction, whereas before, the operating system never really had to involve itself with what the file system was doing. The file system was doing its own thing. Does that make sense to everybody? And why it's a big deal. So now, on the next page, I do want to point something out. On the bottom of page 72, I put this last line. LBA equals cylinders, heads, sectors, the heads, heads and sectors per track. This is the actual formula. It's not, I didn't put a slide. I should have probably put a slide, but it's only on the bottom of page 72. This was just to prove to you that logical block addressing is still a variation of cylinders, heads, and sectors the way it was in the olden days on the very first hard drives we were using. When they finally went to logical block addressing, they just used a calculation from cylinders, heads, and sectors to do the ba same basic premise. But they involve something else now called a zone table. And the zone table basically breaks content up into football fields on the hard drive. And I'll get into that again later and try to show you what I mean. But this is one of those things that this is the only page I have that I put this information on. Uh, and eventually I'll make this a slide, I guess. But the whole point is that we used old technology to get to the new technology for the new location. And there's still a physical uh, location that you can visually see when you're talking about where your data exists. In the old days, it was a lot easier with cylinders, heads, and sectors because you could be exact. You could say, on this platter, in this location, at this spot, is where I'm storing my Word document. Well, now we can only visually see it by an approximation. Uh, so if you told me that you know I'm at sector that's 20% into the drive, I can guess about where 20% of the drive is. I can't tell you exactly. I can't tell you which side of which platter it's on or what it is exactly at that point. That's a translation thing that has to happen in firmware, and I'd need firmware to be able to do it. Okay? Everybody good so far? All right, I know it's a lot of information, but... Your drive is very imperfect. It's always been imperfect. Even when you first start up your drive, your drive looks perfect. When you first buy a drive, if you were to look at the smart tables and you were looking to see how many sectors have been reallocated or, you know, you can't see your P-list, so you don't know what that is, um, they mapped out all that bad stuff to get rid of it so that you can't see it. And there's a very good reason for that. And I'll show you what this reason is. So, again, I might be the only old person at this age that can do this. Uh, not saying I'm the oldest. Might I give you a run for your money, maybe. Uh, but the rest of you are younger, right? I'm guessing. How old are you? Yeah, you're getting up there. You're getting close, but. 60. Yep. So I'm 52. I'll be 53 in another month or two. So, But I've done this since I was 12 years old. I'm that little kid who was running around at Sears who was touching everything. And I was making it all work, too. Uh, but, so... The story that I have for you is this. I was probably 18 or 19 years old. There was no computer stores. There was pretty much no such thing. Maybe there was an Apple store somewhere, but there was no computer stores, especially over here on the East Coast. It was really hard. So there was these traveling gypsy shows is the best way to describe this. You know how they do the gun shows and you see up on the billboard, gun show on you know, blah, 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 so-and-so day. Maybe not in Virginia anymore, but uh, <laughs> depending on the current situation you're in now. Uh, but that's how they used to do the computer shows. So what had used to happen is they would have these traveling people who would be bringing their truckloads full of computer equipment and selling stuff at a civic center off of a table, just like a gun show. And so you would walk around at the tables and you would be looking for your equipment, trying to find a good deal. And uh, so... This is how it was. I, here I am, I'm like 18 years old. I'm walking around and I'm looking at these I'm looking at these drives. And this is what everybody did. Everybody I knew, I was in all of these hacker clubs, computer clubs, 
whatever you want to call them. This is what a drive looked like when it was on the table when you were walking around. And they had these labels on them. You know what that label is? Defect list. It's the defect list for everything bad on the drive. So as you walk around at the table, here's what had to happen. And it's hard to get this concept down for people today. So we had no Xerox machine or copier at home. We had no cell phone that had a camera. We didn't have a digital camera. There was no such thing. The closest thing you got was I could get a Polaroid. But a piece of film was pretty expensive to take one picture of this so that I could then later plug it into the computer. There was no automatic process for plug your drive in and your drive get recognized by the system and know everything about it. So you had to copy this list by hand. You had to write it down. Then you put your hard drive in your computer. This is why you couldn't look at it because it's in your computer, in a case. And you put your computer back together. You turn it on and then you go into the BIOS and you say, I have a new hard drive. And then you put everything in. You had to figure out sector, cylinder. We had a book this thick. I'm not kidding you. It was called the Hard Drive Configuration Manual. It was like this big. And you look up your hard drive in the book and tell you cylinders, heads, and sectors. And you enter that in to the BIOS. Then you go to the defect list and you type every one of those in. And you better not fat finger one of them because if you do, it will mess up as soon as you try to write something to it or do something to it. So you would enter your defect list into the BIOS on your computer for your hard drive. No joke. There was no automation to this. This is how it was. And so this is a small list. There are drives that have huge, giant lists. I mean, it was like, I don't know if this is one of them, but... Uh, but, I mean, effectively, this is what you were doing. You were making this list so that you could type them in. So, nobody would buy any of these drives. So, the manufacturer, whoever they bought them from, they better get a small list or that dude was never selling that hard drive. People walk around and look at his table and be like, oh, I ain't typing that in, and walk away. That's how we bought hard drives. That, there was no other way. That was the only way I recall for years buying hard drives from vendors. That was the best you could get. And of course the nice thing was is that once he was on his way, he didn't you didn't know you couldn't recontact him and get a warranty. There's no warranty on these things. You can never get your stuff again. So this is why IDE hard drives exist. IDE integrated all that stuff and that table and put the table inside of its hard drive. We had servo information that basically map, mapped around that and we no longer saw the defect list. There is a huge defect list inside your drive currently. If you have firmware, you can go look at it. You can go pull your P list up and go find that all of the drives when they're manufactured have problems. They are not perfect and they're not going to ever be perfect. They're so bad that every single sector has enough ECC in it that, and that's error correcting code, to automatically repair or replace that sector on the fly if that data can be read well enough. So some sectors have that content in them that can repair some of it. It's a little bit, I don't want to say parity, but it's a little bit like parity. Error correcting code is a map of sectors and the layout of the content that if you have a minimal amount of errors while it's reading that sector, it can repair it on the fly. It's four, four bits for every 512 bytes. So basically you have a, a chunk of data that's in there for every set and it can be larger. Does that make sense? So uh, AS400s, anybody use AS400 before? Yep. So AS400s are the one thing that they, so the idea that we have 512 bytes per sector is a figment of our imagination. That's just what we made it. It doesn't have to be that. Drives can be anything you want them to be, it's just nobody else made them anything else except IBM. IBM, well, we, we do have them different on CD-ROMs and DVDs and uh, worm drives and things like that. But IBM on an AS400 added 10 more bytes to that content of ECC code. So their sectors are not 512 bytes. They're 522 bytes. And by them being 522 bytes, even though they look like a regular hard drive or a regular SCSI hard drive that you could plug into a system and work, they don't because your system's expecting 512 bytes to work. So therefore, when you plug in this drive, it will not work 
you will not be able to image it with a write blocker. The current write blockers that are all made are hard coded. So tableaus are all hard coded to 512 bytes. So if you had to make an image of an AS400, you cannot use the current write blockers and the things that you have to do it. However, you can do it with Linux by itself. With Linux, you can specify the block sizes that you want to copy. And so you can copy the 512 bytes, and then you can filter them off later. So you can image them and then get rid of those extra 500, the extra 10 bytes of ECC afterwards and make it a standard 512 so you can process it. So just know that those are the kind of things that happen. What happens when you take a drive that is working fine and runs in another system, but it has a different size sector, when you plug it into the write blocker, the write blocker crashes. So you can't see it, there's no prompt, it just locks up, it just doesn't work at all. None of the buttons work and the little display won't work and things don't work. But, uh, but when you know something's working, then you start investigating why. And I've had to do AS400s before, so that's why I'm bringing that up. So it does happen from time to time, still fairly rare. Surprisingly, AS400s also use four hard drives, so by default when they're built, there are four hard drives in uh, a Stripe configuration. They're not even in a RAID 5 configuration. It's like a super expensive machine with all the stuff that needs to be done. So they added the redundancy to the sectors instead of adding redundancy by having a drive. So they're not in a RAID 5 configuration. They are striped. So that's when you're, when you're in a RAID 0 situation with a very pertinent machine, that seems like a pretty big deal. But that's what happens. So everybody good so far? All right. You guys want to take a break again before we get to this next section? Everybody good? Bathroom? Coffee? Drugs? Yes? All right. We'll take a break for a minute.